Hi, welcome to Sonic Thorns. On today's episode, I'd like to welcome a very special guest. I've got Jim Gilmore of the Canadian progressive rock band Saga on. Uh, Jim uh, is Gilmore's playing is probably some of the most, he's got some of the most intricate um, stylings, uh, I believe, in, in his area and his genre of music and beyond. Uh, so welcome to the show, Jim. How are you doing? Good. Not too bad. How are you doing, man? I'm fantastic. I'm here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, I really, really, really uh, would like to say a grand thank you to you for be coming on the show. Uh, this is just started about five months ago, and uh, it really is a huge honor to have you on. Right on. My pleasure. So if you if you wouldn't mind uh, telling the audience just where, uh, what are your roots as far as uh, how it all started for you when it comes to musical influences? Uh, well, uh, I started playing accordion when I was nine. That's how it started. And so I used to do all that kind of stuff. And mainly my main influences were all classical. And then, uh, and then when I, and then I studied music at university and, uh, and then, um, you know, I was all, you know, in high school, I started listening to Yes and Genesis and things like that. And I always loved that. And then I was taking time off university and a couple of buddies of mine formed a band. And uh, we did all, you know, progressive stuff. Yes, Genesis, uh, UK, uh, Gentle Giant. And then uh, uh, that was only for like six months and it wasn't going anywhere. So I was gonna go back to university to get my degree. And when Saga's management called me because they heard me and asked if I would be interested. And I, I said, sure. So I never went back to university. <laughs> right. Uh, what, so I have to mention, you come on very strong um, as a longtime admirer of the uh, third record, Silent Night, which came out in 1980. Uh, there's, you come on very strong. It's almost as if the band knew what they had uh, at their disposal. Like with you involved, they knew what they had. Uh, there was a great strength there with having you as a new member of the band at the time. And you come on with Don't Be Late with that very signature keyboard line. It's immediately um, instantaneous and we immediately get that there's this newfound power in the band. Uh, was that something that you brought to the band personally, you feel like just this new component? Well, I mean, we all we rehearsed, I remember, in a small, small room in downtown Toronto. And then then we moved to another place up in, in more northern Toronto and uh, and I my CS80 at the time that was a pretty distinctive instrument so we all rehearsed together it's not like uh, here guys here's a whole song uh, <laughs> let's right. do you know we all worked on parts and and worked off each other fantastic is the um, a very signature key element of saga sound involves the uh, complex trade-offs uh, between soloing between the guitar, uh, Ian Crichton's guitar and your keyboard lines. Is that something uh, that was already sort of established on the first two records uh, that self-titled debuted in Images at Twilight? But um, I, again, is that something that you just like gelled in with them as far as like continuing on that, what they had started? On oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, now there's other bands are doing that. But I mean, we were one of the first, if not the first to do that. Now, I know Deep Purple did it, but they used organ. And um, in jazz, they had done it. Chick Corea had done it. And, um, uh, but it was something definitely that was, I think, a signature part of the band sound. So, and to this day, when me and Ian are writing, we try to still incorporate that kind of thing in there. Right, and and uh, you're also a singer as well. Uh, we're, we're, is that something that you had always? Uh, you ha have you always been a singer from the very beginning? Well, that's the thing. When I went to university, I was in opera school, so <laughs> I wanted to be an opera singer. So yeah, I studied voice for years, and piano was a last minute thing for me. I didn't start till I was seventeen. So really, yeah. so you were you're a singer first. And then yep. uh, piano player second. In my in my that first band I told you about called Everest, I was the singer, and the only reason I started playing keyboards is because our keyboard player never showed up for rehearsal, so I had to learn all the parts. Right. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so is that something that became immediate, like immediately apparent for the band when they found out that you were a vocalist and that y they were open enough to have you actually sing a couple songs on every record? Well, that took a little while. I mean, um, I couldn't just come in the first album and start singing, but I wanted to, but they wouldn't let me. <laughs> but, uh, and then on the, of course, Worlds Apart, No Regrets, and, and then Scratching, but I had a lot of help from Rupert Hine because even though I had been classically trained as a singer, to get that more rock voice that, you know, that's, that just doesn't come, but for me, it didn't come that easy. So I needed a bit of coaching, as you say. Yeah, um, may you rest in peace, Ripper Hine, incredible producer, um, his work with you guys on Heads or Tails, Worlds Apart, uh, some of the best work you guys have ever done. My yeah, opinion. I agree. He was great and, and fun, too. It was fun actually being in the studio with him. I mean, he was we, very unorthodox, right? Yeah, we do things in the studio that, like Mike sang on the loose up in the loft right. in the barn. And then, the, and for no regrets, um, he wanted me to have a harsh voice. And I have a pretty soft, angelic type voice. So right. he wanted it to be more rough. So we, I went up to the loft also in the studio. I recorded up there. And for hours, he wouldn't let me have a drink of water, gave me joints. So I dry my throat. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, so that's how. Yeah, we he'd do things like that and wake Mike up in the middle of the morning, in the wee hours of the morning, to sing part of "Wind Him Up." And oh, it was just fun. I mean, it was fun the things that we that he did. He he helped take the band, uh, evolve the band in a big way, I believe, because uh, to me, those first three records are almost like a trilogy in themselves and then with Worlds Apart it was almost like the beginning of a new chapter in Saga's career. He really helped with the vocals, you know, and brought Mike's vocals more, same thing, he was in choirs too, so he was more classical. So Rupert brought that voice out in, in Michael a lot too. Arrangement wise, we pretty much had it all because we, we lived in uh, Maidenhead, England. We rented a house, big house there for six or seven months and we wrote all worlds apart there every day we were up writing and rehearsing so when we finally got into the studio to lay the bed tracks we set everything up and got the drum sounding good and everything and we played the first i think the first thing we recorded was uh, conversations i'm yes, pretty sure answer. i think so i'm pretty yeah. sure and then uh, and rupert and steve taylor after we did our first run through, they said, well, what do you want us to do? <laughs> so so uh, we had all the arrangements already pre-done, but he, Rupert helped with uh, getting unique sounds and like the vocals and just uh, augmenting a lot of things and bringing out the best performances that we could. You know. Was there um, any consideration prior to Rupert Hines' uh, involvement on Worlds Apart to have another producer, or was he the first uh, producer from the get-go? Oh, no, we had uh, auditions. <laughs> we had meetings, and in that house in Maidenhead, we'd have the producers come over, some pretty big-name ones, too. Really? They came over, and... Uh, and um, <clears throat> I think we met with five, six, seven, and then, then, then after Rupert, we actually talked to Bob Ezrin about producing us, and I don't know why that never happened. I think that was a mistake, but uh, yeah. Bob Ezrin was um, coming off of you know Pink Floyd and uh, yeah. with Wish You Were Here, and uh, I believe around eighty, eighty one, he had produced the uh, Kiss record, Music from the Elder. Yeah. But yeah, so that very interesting, but he's obviously a very conceptualist type producer. He has a major vision for when he produces. A yeah, we album. had, that's when we lived in the Bahamas and he came down to see us and we had dinner with him and talked and everything. And I can't remember exactly why it never happened. Maybe he wanted too much money up front or something. I don't know. You, you said you were in the Bahamas. Was, was that during the like behavior era or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. 
Um, if you don't mind me asking, just jumping through, uh, Symmetry, uh, the new record out March 12th, very different record for Saga from, I haven't heard it yet, obviously, it hasn't been released yet, but uh, I will, I have it pre-ordered on Amazon.com, can't, can't wait to uh, listen to it from front to back. You heard the three singles though, right? I have, I've heard uh, Wind Em Up, Tired World, and uh, Always There, which right. uh, all sound, I mean, to me, the biggest uh, change on uh, from the three singles I've heard was with a song like Tired World and World um, Wind Em Up, as far as like, what you guys have done with these tracks you guys have reinvented them from the ground floor and just built them back up into seemingly entirely new sounding songs even though they're from back in the day that was the idea <laughs> so so what considering the keyboards are a huge component of the saga sound as we know it what 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 did you bring to the table as far as I know you play flute and, and you do some accordion and you there are you do woodwind type instruments. Is that what you brought to the table for this record? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I mean a lot of the synth parts now done on accordion, or I'd play two or three clarinet parts to build up a chord, you know. It took quite a long time. It was pretty uh, you know especially clarinet, you can only play one note at a time. So it have to build up certain things. And you know, I had to get my practicing back up again for that. Cause uh, uh, when you hear the record, there's some pretty, pretty fast, um, complex clarinet runs that have, you know, that I wrote all out and I haven't practiced them. And uh, cause uh, I'm not a full-time clarinetist, but uh, I was pretty good at one time. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's um, what I what I love is you've taken certain again. I haven't heard these tracks, but from what I've read from the uh, titles, you've taken. Oh, uh, no worries. It's my cousin in Scotland. <laughs> I'm I'm hearing Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, all Star Trek sounds in my iPhone. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Huge fan. So. Yeah, me too. Great. So so. I was asking, there's um, something about the record with you doing what you're doing on this new record, allowing you to flex, uh, you know, other sides of your, uh, you know, your musicality. But is there something, is there a particular track on this record that you felt gave you the most of a workout as far as like top to bottom? Is there a particular song that made you go, wow, like that, that was some hard work? Uh, Pitch Man's one of them. And um uh, the end of uh, no regrets. Right. Uh, no, that no, that one wasn't too bad. Man, I can't remember now. There was some moments there that I really had to work in the studio, and there's some lines where I played a clarinet, played accordion line, these fast lines, and then then a couple of days later, I, I I would double that on clarinet. So there's that kind of thing going on. So yeah, there was some uh, some uh, hair hair pulling out times <laughs> and you guys all did it from your home studios too right? i went down to i did most of my stuff with jim and at his place and he lives in port stanley which is two and a half hours from toronto on lake erie so i went down to his place and spent time there uh, i know that's recording. interesting you mentioned jim uh jim Crichton because he um he had sort of been out of the band as far as like touring commitments for a little while correct yeah so he's still yeah. involved on this record oh yeah very much he, he was the uh he's the guy who pretty much brought it all together and all the parts and then uh, once once all the parts were in he'd work with the mixing with our friend brian forker in nashville so uh yeah no he he was a big big part uh, Brian Forker is the um, he goes way back with you guys, right? I mean, yeah, he's done a few. Yeah, he uh, I believe he was an engineer or a mixer on um, Wildest Dreams, uh, and then he kind of he, he's kind of a disciple of Keith Olsen in a way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he moved to Nashville and started doing a bunch of country things, and so for him on this album was perfect because you know we have the fiddle and the, and stuff on it, so. So he, he thinks this album is special and he, he's hoping that it gets treated with the respect it is. And the record company is really 
going out of their way this time. This album's getting more attention than anything we've done in five albums. Do you think that has something to do with just like the uh, stopgap between uh, the last record, which was released in 2014, and and just the the just there's an anticipation there for new saga music. Well, there's that, and because it's so different, and people are, you know, some people like what they hear, some people don't like it. One guy on Facebook goes, "I there's some songs material that should not be played acoustically." I wrote back to him. I said, well, that's exactly why we did it. <laughs> Fantastic response. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been seeing that as well, and it bothers me a little bit. I'm not going to lie, not just because I'm biased about you guys but uh, as a band, but just the fact that you guys, the intention was clear from the beginning that you were taking these songs and just giving them a, a new outlook and reinventing them. And I think there's something really unique about that. I mean, there's I've seen there's like a suite there almost. It's got like a couple tracks from um, Trust, from the Trust record, yeah, which was released in 06 and um, like the other side of the hall. And it's got a, there's a, there's a couple of tracks in there. Yeah, from so that a lot, some of the, a couple of these we had done live on Jim on the, the 2017 tour. I don't remember which one. We opened for ourselves acoustically. As pockets, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um yeah, at first people didn't know who pockets were until, of course, me and Mike walked out first, and and then oh, okay. So some of these songs are from that, and we just we've changed them even since then. But but we were gonna do a, a live acoustic album. We have everything recorded and filmed. Uh, we've all the shows were recorded and filmed, and we just thought, man, it's gonna take for ever to go through all these things and you know and edit them and correct you know acoustic instruments go out of tune and why don't we just do a proper recording you know the record company at first wanted us to do like the typical string quartet nice you know and we we started off that way and then Jim goes now nah, let's go the other way let's get let's get someone like Jerry Goodman in there like Maha Mahavishnu Orchestra and really, you know, blow people away. So that's the way we wanted to go. So. I, I'd have to say uh, the most interesting song that from I've, that I've seen on the track list is you've even included a track that you sang on 1994 Steel Umbrellas record, Say Goodbye to Hollywood, which yeah. is a very um, divisive record for a lot of fans I, I personally enjoy it i know it was uh, a lot of the music was written for the um canadian cobra, show yeah. cobra yeah it but, wasn't um, canadian but yeah. i i love I, I love that i love a lot of parts on that record i like um songs like why not and you shake that tree which is a very different kind of song for you but i love that so i love your vocal on that on that track uh, thanks to uh, we've never done that live really so <laughs> I just think that's a real, a really, really great song. And but say goodbye to Hollywood again, another underrated gem. And I'm glad you guys included it on this record in a new form. Yeah, that's what. I mean, we were going to do an acoustic album years ago, and it's something I already had kind of arranged, and I had it, you know, on a computer somewhere, and we just reworked it, and you know, and uh, did all the acoustic treatments on there, and yeah, it's, it turned out nice. I thought. Uh, is is um is there any talk right now? I know I, I've listened to a couple of uh, interviews lately with uh, Michael Sadler, but uh, is there talk about you guys after this making an an, an all originals record again, a traditional? Well, I've, I've been writing a lot. I mean, there's nothing else to do during this pandemic, so you know, every day when I'm in the mood, it doesn't happen every day, but when I'm in the mood, I'll sit down at my keyboard and computer and and come up i've come up with quite a lot of parts lots and lots of material so and, and our new bass player dusty he's got a studio in his house so i'll be going up there working with him on it on stuff too so yeah we will be doing a new album when all depends i mean right. let this one run its course and then uh i'm pretty sure people will want to do it and i know dusty is dying to be on a saga record so <laughs> there there's a is there any truth to the um i remember uh past interviews uh, probably a couple years ago or so before the pandemic ever happened 
there was talk about you and Ian doing something together. Is that right? Yeah, we still have material in the bank, and uh, there's been some, you know, setbacks, but uh, but we do have stuff, and <coughs> we were uh, we were talking to uh, Spock's beard singer, and um, Ted, and uh, he we sent him a couple of things, and he did a great job on it. So, and then Saga started touring again, and. Uh, so that kind of put that on hold. You got to go where your bread's buttered. <laughs> right, right. As, as uh, I think most bands have that figured out, right? That's yeah. just the way it is. I'm sure after this pandemic, uh, there's going to be plenty of uh, artists going back to their where their bread is buttered. Uh, respect. Yeah. Bands. And it, it could be hard because, I mean, no one's been touring for a year and everyone's going to want to come out and... I think it's going to be a rough year. I don't. I don't see audiences being jam packed, you know, because. But you never know. I don't know. I, I have to ask you what What is your take on Saga's perseverance throughout their career? I mean, to me, one of the most commendable things about the band that attracted me to you guys, besides the music, was the fact that strength for strength for strength, you strength to strength, you continued and carried out this long career uh full of productivity throughout your i mean it just never stopped really i mean from the second you joined and i mean from let's just say from even before then from 76 77 the band has carried on uh no matter what um has made over 20 records at this point um what do you think uh where do you think that comes from uh for one thing we care and every Every album, even if you like it or not, we worked hard on it, you know, and and uh, and and we we enjoy it, and we're and we're all good friends. So this is all part of that. And we, I don't I mean I haven't seen Ian in a year, face to face. I mean I talk to him on the phone every other day, but and I uh, haven't seen the only person I have seen since the last tour. We came home March fourteenth last year. The only person I have seen is Dusty because he doesn't live too far from me, but the other guys uh, haven't even seen them. So when we do see each other, it's like a family reunion almost. Right. <laughs> so, so if you don't mind, uh, just before we wrap this up, uh, I'd like to just mention a couple of uh, a few, at least five songs from your career in Saga and uh, just getting some of your thoughts or memories on, on uh, maybe recording or what was going on during that time period, if, that, if that's all right with you. Sure. Okay, so a song like Time to Go off of 1980's Silent Night. What does that bring up for you? It reminds me of Kenneth McKellar, a Scottish folk singer. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, because when, when uh, Jim and Mike first wrote that and we were rehearsing it, he goes, yeah. Just think of Kenneth McKellar when you play that. <laughs> that that to me is one of the most underrated. I mean, Saga in itself is underrated, but that to me is vastly. I think that's an incredible song, and I think it never really got the accolades. I can see that being played by a by an entire symphony. It's very yeah. Iconic. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's on the new album too, so part of it. So. Fantastic. Um, how about a song like "Scratching the Surface"? Well, that went through a couple of changes. We rented a cottage up north for the summer in between our U.S. tours. And uh, that was just something I had a few ideas for and and Jim helped me shape it. And then uh, when we got to England to record it, uh, Rupert really helped me on the vocal with that one because it was my first real rock vocal. And, uh, you know, and then it became a pretty big hit, so. That was pretty neat. <laughs> if, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I, I can even hear Rupert singing background vocals on that track. I, yeah, he, he does. Yeah. It's incredible. He sang back up on a few songs. Yeah, he's got a very distinct voice. I mean, you can hear it on his um, records that he produced for The Fix, even. Yeah, well, his own records are amazing. And uh, there's one song I'd like to do of his, you know, just myself. And, uh, that would be amazing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, how about a song like Nine Lives of Miss Meaty, which was on, it was an interlude track on Behavior, which was really <laughs> yeah. five. I love that. Uh, very atmospheric. Uh, well, that's when the, you know, the whole 80s MIDI thing started happening. And 
uh, you used to have to layer sounds track by track, which still is a great way to do things. But it was just my little joke, you know. I didn't know what else to call it. <laughs> I, I love that track, and it perfectly uh, segues right into um, You and the Night, which is, uh, again, another fantastic song. <laughs> But um, how about a song like Days Like These off of 1993's Security of Illusion? You know, I'd forgotten about that song because it's written about my dad when he passed away. And um, so I kind of put it in the background. And then last year we were in Chicago. We did a, a gig there and um, we were in Dusty's room. He said, we got to do this song. And he played it. And our, our friend who's a pilot, he said, yeah, you got to do that. Then we did it on the last tour and it went over great. So I'd like to continue doing it. Yeah, it's a fantastic song. Um, so with that being said, Jim, uh, thank you for coming on to Sonic Dorms. Again, a uh, brand new podcast, but we're all about just sharing music history with anybody and everybody around the world. Right on. I really appreciate you coming. How's the weather in Orlando? Uh, muggy, humid, and uh, hot, and very erratic. You never know where it's going to go. It could be uh, dark clouds one second and then uh, bright sun the next. Well, I have a good friend who lives in Orlando. I used to go over there all the time because I used to live in Virginia. So I used to drive down to Florida a lot to see this guy. Yeah, and uh, saw him last year. We played a birthday party in Tampa. But my friend in Orlando, he did all the production. So and he did production at the Super Bowl too. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, but, but again, uh, I, I hope I uh, wish you all the best success on the new record, Symmetry, which is out March 12th. It'll be out. We're all streaming uh, on all streaming platforms. But uh, I would say this is a record like all Saga records. This is an album that you have to purchase, listen to from front to bottom because I all Saga <laughs> records. No, that, to me, Saga is. Um, like a lot of my favorite bands are it's a there you guys are a band that deserve to be heard 150 percent no distractions uh top to bottom you guys make albums even to this day i mean this is a, to me an album experience right on well i hope you enjoy it when you get it and uh yeah we'll talk again sometime i hope so maybe we can do a, a special where we talk we get in uh we talk more about your albums and uh, sure. like the saga records and yeah like, I'd love to get your thoughts on uh, just working on certain records like Behavior. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. We'll do it, you know, in a couple of months or something. All right, thank you so I'm much. sure there's going to be time. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show, Jim. Okay, man. All right, see ya. See ya.